Okay, so our next speaker is another one of uh, Bill Sherry's astronomy students. Uh, please welcome Elizabeth Pinto, and she's also an AAC, AAC uh, high school student. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Pinto. Uh, thank you all so much for coming today. I'm very excited to be speaking with you all. I took Astronomy 112 this semester and was asked to write a um, six to eight page paper on something in astronomy that interests me. And I found pulsars and I thought they were actually quite interesting. So today I'll be going over with you the history of pulsars, how they were found, um, how they form, how they die, and uh, other recent studies that have been made. Um, about how pulsars can further, further the exploration of other scientific astro astronomy um, research. So from the beginning, just a little history. My research actually goes back all the way to 1932 when James Chadwick first discovered neutrons. A year later, uh, Bade and Zwicky uh, actually considered the presence of neutron in stars. Their um, information on uh, stars and telescopes wasn't great back then, but it ended up further progressing. In 1939, Oppenheimer and Volkoff then printed the theory of neutrons in stars. So then came this telescope. Um, Jocelyn Bell was the founder of Pulsar. She actually found them on accident. So her and a group of representatives from Cambridge University uh, built a telescope, which was then ready for use in 1967. So Bell and her professor Hewish started annualization and studied these for about two months and ended up with uh, about 30 meters worth of charts daily. So they definitely had a lot to look over. Um, over time, they ended up finding little glitches in their discovery which they called scruff. So this scruff, they didn't really know what it was. Um, it was disruption within the documented signals, and it showed as a brightly shining light in a specific patch of the sky with intervals of exactly 1.3 seconds. But there were only so many options of what they could be. So Bell talked to her professor, Hewish, who said, well, 1.3 seconds is too rapid for a star, given that the mass of a star is much too large to be able to rotate every 1.3 seconds. He said, so it must be man-made. So they looked over a couple different options, and they realized that radar reproduction from the moon wasn't an option. Satellite in a bizarre orbit wasn't an option. They even considered quasars. Um, and they also took another telescope and even considered that the telescope that they were using might have been faulty. And over time, they realized that their telescope was fine. They even considered LGM, or little green men. So aliens were even an option. But they didn't really know about aliens. They knew that they had discovered something, but they didn't really know yet. So they were like, let's not make this quite public quite yet. Let's wait a little bit longer to see if we come up with anything else. So Belle looked back on her, you know, 60 meters of <laughs> data annualization and found that there were two other pulsating forces within two different parts of the sky. And she said, you know, they, they pulse, let's call them pulsers. So their findings were actually going to be published within the uh, Nature Journal, and, uh, Nature Journal, and uh, Professor Hewish ended up presenting this information uh, during a meeting with of Cambridge astronomers. During his meeting, a colleague of his named Fred Hoyle stated that the remains uh, that the remains of a supernova could be paid could be capable of ma making such a pulse and that they should be considered. After Fred Hoyle published his findings, Thomas Gold then says, no, it's not a pulse, it's just a rotating beam. So where it gets exciting, um, I'm gonna talk to you guys about the formation. So the process to make this supernova, which will eventually be a neutron star, takes just a little bit over than 11 million years. So for a star to be a neutron star, it needs to be um, within eight times to 25 times the size of our sun. So what happens is, and as Chelsea spoke with you guys a little bit earlier, um, it all starts with molecular clouds uh, forced by gravity that end up um, forming a protostar. So hydrogen, uh, it, 
thanks to gravity, is forced towards the center, and a fusion reaction is giving off heat. This fusion, re this fusion reaction, fusion reaction is um, giving off force, which is then, and then the gravity is pushing on that force, which forms the round sphere. Um, so that fusion reaction from hydrogen forms helium, and um, because of this fusion reaction, it is no longer needed. It no longer needs gravity in order to form by itself. Um, the fusion reaction of helium then creates oxygen and carbon. Over time, uh, neon, sodium, and magnesium form, and then silicon and sulfur. So within the last week of its life, uh, silicon and sulfur then make iron, but because there is lack of radiation. Iron cannot form a fusion reaction. Therefore, there is no force pushing out, and the gravity is still pushing in, so the star then collapses on itself. During this time, in the core of the star, protons and electrons are forced together to make neutrons and neutrons. And at this time, a shock wave from the core assembles isotopes of each element of the star, and a supernova happens. The process of the star collapsing takes just a few seconds. Uh, this massive explosion gleams more luminous than all of the galaxy combined during this time. What's left is the central neutron star and just one sugar cube of this worth of the material in this, uh, in this neutron star would weigh about 100 million tons. But why so bright and why the lighthouse effect? So the neutron star spins on its axis and out of each end, not directly from the axis, but the neutron uh, star constantly beams radio waves and radioactive particles. Um, this light can only been be seen if it's pointed towards your direction. So what Bell was picking up was the uh, radio waves and the radioactive particles that were rotating, shining a light, but you can only see the light if it's pointed in your direction, so she was actually seeing the light as it was passing. So like I said, because of its rotation, it appears to be pulsing or given off the lighthouse effect. And this star will rotate, depending on the star, about a second or faster for the next 20 million years. So over time, um, many scientists studied more and more about neutron stars and pulsars specifically, and a, an astronomer named Stairs actually noticed a glitch. So due to the high amounts of energy, um, excuse me, uh, due to the high amounts of energy emitted while rotating, energy is actually lost and the revelations become less fre frequent. So if we look up at the um, makeup of the star, the outer crust is made up of crystalline, the inner crust is neutron-loaded lo nuclei within free, neutron, free neutrons, um, they call this the superfluid, and then the core is made up of neutron uh, excuse me, liquid neutrons. So as the star is emitting uh, energy due to the radioactive waves and the radioactive particles, um, it actually loses energy and starts um, rotating slower. The superfluid, however, keeps rotating as fast as the star was before. So due to angular momentum, the star actually glitches or catches on the superfluid and then uh, revolutions frequently for a, cu a couple seconds, maybe 30, and then it goes back to its rev uh, regular revelations for the next couple hundreds of days. So other uses, uh, two astronomers in 1933 run a Nobel Prize, and they noticed the disruption between space and time due to gravitational waves uh, were because of movements of stars and planets, and the pulsars were being used to further uncover informational uh, information on gravitational waves. Gravitational waves um, can be left over from the Big Bang Theory, they can be from black holes, any planets moving, anything of that sort. So today I went over with you uh, pulsars, how they form, the history behind them, uh, how they die, and other explorations used using pulsars. Do I have any questions? Thank you very much. Have a great day.